this one is uh, somewhat different from what we've seen so far in that um, I believe most of the monastic, uh, most of the Buddhist materials were probably made for monastic shrines. Right? They were made for monasteries uh, or for shrines associated with monasteries. Uh, most of the Jain ones uh, as well, would, would uh, there were a lot of lay people involved in making uh, shrines, but they also had, had monks. Um, sometimes they were temporarily attached to monasteries. Um, and with many of the, the Hindu temples, uh, those are pretty much straightforward and, and rather orthodox in a way. Um, they, they would have Brahmins who would uh, perform the rituals. And with, um, with deities or gods, in the case of the Hindus, who would uh, be well known from a variety of types of texts, especially the Puranas, but also the epics. Uh, so there would be literature around them. Um, but the deity that you see on, on the screen before you, whose name is Manasa, uh, it seems to have percolated up from uh, the grassroots, from the villages, and from tribal areas, and, and is not a sort of a top-down construction um, like Shiva is in some heaven. The, this is a, a demigod. This is an earth goddess who is... Uh, very much about um, life and its continuity in the fields, in the jungles, in the rivers. And I stated earlier that there's a kind of ambivalence about snakes um, and about um, that they, they are sometimes divinized, uh, but they're also uh, revered and respected. And uh, Manasa really... Uh, embodies or personifies that ambivalence. Uh, she was, by the time that, that images like this were made, I think her cult, if you will, was probably appropriated by the Brahmanical um, orthodoxy. Uh, that, that eventually, uh, and still today, there are actual temples in especially when, uh, Bengal. In Bengal, that was the heart of Manasa territory, though, though uh, she appears in different forms in Odisha and in, um, and in South India too. But it's, it seems to have percolated up from the people who sought protection from one of the dangers of their lives, of their daily lives, which was um, cobras and, and snakes in the fields and, as I said, in the, in the water and on the paths. And so they, um, although today there are temples dedicated to Manasa, there's still an important cult of Manasa that is uh, especially strong among, uh, to, to use crude language, lower caste or middle caste uh, villagers in Bengal and not the, the Brahmanical ones. So the, uh, the um, types of images that we're, we, we will see in, in terms of um, done with expensive uh, materials like stone uh, tend to be those objects that, are, um, uh, that have been appropriated already and are being promoted by wealthy people. Now, this one is not a very large object maybe 13 inches, something like that. Um, and so it might have been from a middle level uh, kind of person. Uh, we, uh, the, the, the lower um, uh, economic registers would be um, creating objects in, um, in um, materials that didn't survive. Or they use, and, and it's un unfortunate in this case, but uh, as we'll see in a few moments, right now, uh, this probably had a big pot, just a round pot. And the pots are often used to uh, uh, represent Manasa in the lower caste rituals. So they wouldn't necessarily need a, uh, a, an icon or a murti of the deity, but they would just use a pot that was dedicated to her, and she she would be uh, considered to be worshipped with that. So we're getting into uh, representations that were probably driven by uh, 
the, the bottom up um, local people instead of the elites, instead of the educated, instead of the Brahmanical um, uh, rulers or, or uh, those who wish to be associated with, with that kind of levels of society. And she's shown much like the, um, the one uh, that, we, that we looked at, the, the, the Jain Tathankara, uh, with a, a hood of seven cobras above her. And she is also holding in her, um, in her left hand a, a cobra. And she's holding it in a way that, that is, it's almost like it's her child. Uh, we'll see some other images of female goddesses where uh, she hold, they hold a child in the same hand, on the same leg, uh, much like that. And many, many folk stories uh, survive about Manasa. Uh, and they are, of course, because they've been written down and then they've been translated uh, so that we have access to them, they have gone through the filter of the, uh, the elites uh, who were going to create the literature. But nevertheless, a number of uh, sort of countercultural elements uh, survive in, in her story where she resisted Brahmins. She resisted uh, she, she sought them out as, uh, you should be worshiping me, uh, but they, uh, they discounted her as just a tribal goddess, and uh, she had to go to great lengths to get them to eventually build um, uh, temples uh, to her. So even in the story, there are elements of, of the history of the cult uh, of Manasseh that uh, we think... Yeah, it can be can be discerned in her story, and it's a struggle in a way between classes. Now, um, the Manasa uh, ha is uh, almost exclusively the images that I'm going to show you um, are from either uh, originally Bangla or the place that became Bangladesh or or West Bengal, and they show her in a very similar form. Um, with uh, her, she briefly had a had a rishi, a brahmin as a husband, but but uh, she, uh, the rishi left her uh, briefly because he was afraid of snakes, um, uh, and he's shown as a as an ascetic, uh, as a so he would be a sort of a high caste person, but uh, again abandoned her, uh, and and she's shown uh, almost carrying, and here's the pot. Here's the pot that the tribal people use even today. They would take around and they would go to a plant or a tree that is associated with Manasa, and that tree is uh, has leaves that they believe can counteract the venom of a cobra. So the oja or the shaman or the the low caste priest who is the cult director for the outside of the temple um, would know these kinds of uh, remedies a and would the common people would, would go, to, go to him or her sometimes. Uh, and we, see, we often see female donor figures uh, below. Now, unfortunately, uh, ours, or ours, as if I've been here for two days now, and I'm already saying our Asian Art Museum uh, work, but uh, um, th this work is, uh, is unfortunately broken at, at the places that we would want. But I couldn't resist um, talking about it because it's, it's such a fascinating, uh, fascinating object in, in many ways. And although it's small, it, it, it's, it's powerful, especially when you realize that this is not just an imagination. Uh, I mean, it is and it isn't, but it, but it was meaningful for daily life, uh, for protection against what's, uh, what was a real, um, a real danger. Uh, and uh, the, the, the use of the, the uh, snake hoods um, that we saw in Jain images, actually, I didn't mention, but many of you probably already know that the Buddha was also protected by Muchalinga, who was a snake during, after the Enlightenment period, before he started preaching. He sat at Bodh Gaya, and the rains came, and so Muchalinga, this, this huge... Uh, boa constrictor type uh, cobra came at a snake. And she becomes also connected with um, a, a kind of child protection 
goddess. She becomes merged uh, with that. So I mentioned earlier that sometimes there's a, there's a, uh, the other goddesses hold a child. And, and in this case, um, she does too. And they're, they're, with, with tribal or village cults, um, there's plenty of room for, for uh, they're, not, they're not set in stone, this one literally is, but um, things, things morph, things change. And she, if she's a household protectress, a goddess who would protect against snake bites, she would also be then a protectress uh, for, um, for other kinds of diseases that might decimate families. And so she's kind of a family goddess. Now there's another object in your collection here, you notice I said your this time, um, who, uh, that, it, that depicts a mother goddess and a child and um, it doesn't have a donor figure. Uh, but I thought uh, it's worth bringing into the conversation uh, since we've, we've morphed from a snake goddess to a, a child protectress. Uh, and uh, this m may, uh, may have been a reflection of that cult or vice versa. It might have been images like this that then uh, migrated and merged with the Manasa cult in Bengal. Um, this is, it, the, it, it, I, I believe that this is for probably from Bihar rather than, rather than Bengal. And then you have another object uh, that is on display now that is a, um, a, a child protecting goddess. Uh, and and uh, Manasa, by the way, is also used by unmarried women or the cult is used uh, for fertility. They often go to her uh, and pray that, that they might become pregnant uh, with, with child. And so it's not only um, uh, protecting the already born infant, but also um, to become uh, with child. Uh, and and it, this, this too doesn't have a, um, doesn't have a, a donor figure, but it's still worth, worth thinking because they're implied, someone made it, you know, someone, uh, so the more we look at these, the more we, I think we can um, uh, project with some confidence um, of uh, the kinds of people who would be making these because they don't just appear. Uh, they're, they're made for particular purposes. And so um, I don't want to reduce the uh, women's involvement of art making to the family. Uh, I mean, I think that's a reductive uh, idea of things. Um, and Laurie Patton's excellent quote, that it's, it's, o it's overstating the case to say that women's religious practice only involved as its proper aims, the establishment and welfare of the family. Um, and so clearly women were involved in a, in a range of, of activities um, and values uh, that they held. Um, nevertheless, um, that it, it is one way to explain the rise of, of deities. And, and I don't think in a way that, that that's ultimately reductive of, of women's roles in, in this time because it, it, it suggests that they were actually um, one of the driving forces for the development of religion um, in India at this time um, and that they wanted the religion to reflect uh, some of their immediate values. So in that way it gives them agency on the other hand, I feel a little ambivalent about reducing their agency merely, not merely, but to um, welfare for the family, sort of a domestic um, quality. And we know that they were, they were more than that, but I think we can acknowledge that they were that. Um, and this is in the context of the larger picture that I mentioned where uh, women ha have been kind of undercounted and underestimated for this period. Uh, we know in in um, the earlier period of Buddhism in particular, that women play a huge role uh, in uh, existing inscriptions. Um, but the, the evidence has led us to believe that somehow their activities were less important or less official than that of men. And so the texts like the Dharma Shastras uh, are, are, are normative texts and they suggest that uh, women are mainly wives and within the framework of a patrilineal family and that, that they, they underplay women's economic capacity and autonomy. 
and I, th I think these normative texts, as, as Leslie Orr says, may be misleading. And few of these uh, people have looked at donor, I would almost say only one or two have looked at donor images. And so maybe the, tr the traditional way of looking at um, the, the role of, of women has uh, looked at other kinds of evidence and maybe the, the, um, the roles shifted towards uh, making images or representing themselves making images and away from, I don't know, texts or other kinds of things. But if we, if we take account of the, the um, uh, donor figures, then we, we have to question uh, some of the assumptions, some of the received wisdom. And here's an extreme example of the received wisdom. The early medieval period saw the dramatic deterioration of support for any and involvement of women in Buddhist activities at any and every level, whether in the monastery, in the lay community, or in the newly evolving Siddha systems. We must conclude that overall, medieval Indian women were persuaded to leave Buddhist religious life behind and retreat to their home as their society and increasingly, and sorry about the, the uh, misspelling of society, increasingly their religion exhorted them and frequently forced them to do. Wow. Really? Uh, we must assume that they accepted their position and saw the doors of the Buddhist religion grow narrower before their eyes. And they, they uh, apparently accepted this without demur. And uh, it, it's, it's hard to believe that. Even he says, especially for uh, later tantric esoteric Buddhism. And, well, geez, here's, a, here's a, one of the most tantric of tantric deities, Chakrasambara, uh, from Odisha in the National Museum in New Delhi with uh, two women donors at the, at the bottom. So, um, and I know he, uh, Davidson allows for some exceptions, but I think cumulatively um, we might have to revise uh, some of the ideas that we have. Now, let's get back um, in the few minutes that are, that are left to talk about the motivations for making images. And uh, I, I brought a few inscriptions that are um, a little bit more expansive um, and they're not always image inscriptions. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're for doing other things, but it also tells us what other things people were doing besides making images because that wasn't the only outlet for um, their, their money or their, or their interests. And um, often it's um, the mitigation of the sufferings of the world. Often that is sometimes dedicated to their parents, or others, um, but it's for uh, spiritual merit and frame um, and, and for the fame of their uh, parents, especially their, their loved ones. Um, and literally, it, it would destroy sin and afford victory in this world. Um, and so the, the donor is blessed by gifts, by their gifts uh, and donations, uh, they, they would be uh, recompensed sort of spiritually. So that's the making of the merit. Um, but the motivations are sometimes involved in, in upkeep of the temple, uh, sweeping the mandapa three times uh, daily. I mean, they pay, and I, I, want this, I want this, you know, kept up. I want it um, to uh, whitewash the walls. I want the roof repaired. And so they get the merit uh, for that. Um, and again, it's the, for the attainment. And sometimes they, it's not just for all all beings, but for particular ones, especially the, uh, the teacher, the preceptor, uh, the, uh, and mother and father, uh, and, and then after that, all, all sentient beings. Uh, sometimes we get some information about who uh, was the sculptor. They include the name of the sculptor and who actually inscribed or wrote the inscription. So th those, are, those are really valuable but rare. Um, sometimes they... they you get the idea that maybe Surya images were especially important for curing skin diseases, that apparently Narasimha, the big Kanarak in, in Puri, is a huge, beautiful um, temple, uh, was uh, made by the king after he was cured of leprosy somehow and, and associated with, with Surya. And then there's some very, very touching, uh, poignant motivations for people that, that are uh, ac accessible to us for now. Uh, I mean, even even today, where um, a, a king and the queen, uh, retired king and queen, our our daughter, the Chola queen, 
who was uh, married to the, his, their successor, the successor king, having met with death by an accident, we deposited on her behalf um, to burn a, a perpetual lamp. I mean, that, that we can all understand that, that sort of um, idea. And then another one where um, the son a, and, uh, had, had died um, and the, the father and the mother had dedicated something, uh, land, uh, for a perpetual um, uh, pious act that would be dedicated to leading their son to to heaven. So you know, there's there's it's not just making merit. I mean, there, there's always um, the personal um, ideas involved, though some of them um, don't really talk about the the specifics, but they do mention their attachment to the the preceptor, uh, the the mother and the father, and then um, there are. Um, different ways of including uh, the people who are close to them, including the acharya that I keep mentioning, um, the the teacher. Uh, now, uh, here's a list briefly of of uh, occupations that are that are mentioned in some of the inscriptions that I've gathered so far, and they're not all high caste, uh, but uh, but and there are some that would appear to be relatively lower, mostly middle uh, class uh, people. Um, the monks and the mothers of monks uh, and Buddhist nuns and then the mothers of nuns are often, they identify themselves, I'm the mother of a nun who's in this monastery and I'm, I'm donating a sculpture to the monastery where my daughter is um, or where, where I am a monk or a nun. Um, scribes or clerks are often identified. This particular Kayasta caste often shows up. Um, they seem to be uh, the, the, the writers, the clerks, and, and apparently they made a pretty good living so that they could donate. And, and in a way, we have to think about a donation as possibly a way to raise their own status, as a way to raise the status of their clan, uh, of their caste. Um, and, and that kind of jockeying for position is always going on. So making merit, yeah, but there are surely also going to be um, personal as well as prestige uh, reasons to do things. So there are um, architects, uh, sometimes sculptors identify themselves as being involved, uh, merchants, a lot of merchants, uh, and a lot of wives of merchants. So the, the wife is the principal donor but identifies herself as the wife of, of the illustrious merchant, so-and-so. Um, sometimes officers and ministers, and as we've seen, sometimes kings and queens, but rarely. Uh, they seem to, the kings and queens would, would uh, you know, they don't need to, to donate a single image. They would donate the whole temple, and then inside the temple, uh, in the doorway, would be a, the big plaque, like at the, at the entrance to the museum here. Um, of who are the principal donors. So they would, they would take up all the space and then not show every one. But if you could only afford one, and who knows what they were made for. Maybe they weren't made for public temples. Maybe they were made for personal shrines, in which case the donor is also the recipient uh, in a way. It's, it's for their own personal shrine. That, that's also a possibility that we can't, that we can't exclude. But judges... Um, beetle leaf planters. So in other words, landlords, uh, people with a lot of land who are, who are growing uh, and, and are successful agriculturalists, not day laborers. Um, and then uh, they often identify themselves as Brahmins, uh, Bhatta, and uh, sometimes residents of a named place so that everybody from a certain locale will, will have gone together in a subscription to donate an object. So that sometimes happens. And then a number of artisans, goldsmiths, um, it's uh, understandable, um, and stone carvers sometimes do it as, as well as one vintner. I would have liked to know him. Um, so uh, besides the obvious religious one, there has to be some um, uh, social motivations like prestige, like personal social status. Um, uh, the claim of, uh, you know, our caste is not what you thought it was, but we're actually higher up in the elite, and so we're donating temples uh, for everybody. Um, and then there are these personal uh, motivations and, and the expressions of gratitude that were no doubt. So we're, we're um, I think, right on, right on time. If you, if you happen to have questions, these, again, I just wanted to remind you 
were some of the, uh, the issues that I hope we, we tackled uh, or that you, you can tackle um, yourself. And uh, I thank you very much for your attention.